Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to give everyone a couple seconds to start entering to the webinar and getting connected to audio. Uh, as you all know, it's one of my favorite little icebreakers. And what I'm going to get you to do is just click on that chat tool in your Zoom toolbar and let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, my name is Troy. I'm the Director of Operations for Nurses Specialized in Wound Ostomy Incontinence Canada. I'm tuning in from uh, Ottawa today in the nation's capital. And uh, I'm joined by some friendly, some friendly faces for some of you and maybe new for others. Um, we're joined by our team at Perfuse MedTech, uh, who we thank so much for being able to put on uh, our education today. Uh, today's topic is on lower leg assessment and the role of gecko device in venous leg ulcers. And to present this topic today is none other than Professor Keith Harding. Um, before I get into introducing Professor Harding, just a couple little housekeeping items. Firstly, uh, this is being recorded, so if you're, uh, any of your colleagues are tuning in late or if you want to watch on this uh, a little bit later, we're going to have that on our, conf or, sorry, on our uh, NSWOC website that you can watch a little bit later. You'll also be receiving a certificate of attendance after the fact, so please give us a day or two to get those into your inbox, but uh, do not fret, we will get those to you. Uh, and lastly, we are going to be having a Q&A portion at the end of this webinar. So if you do have any questions, please use that Q&A tool uh, that you see in your Zoom toolbar, and we'll make sure to, to get to as many as we can before the hour ends. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce Professor Harding, who is a worldwide key opinion leader in the clinical area of wound healing. His many past appointments include senior leadership and advisory roles at Cardiff University and the Welsh Innovation Centre in the United Kingdom. He is the editor-in-chief of the prestigious International Wound Journal, and he was also awarded the Commander of the British Empire for services to medicine and health care. He is often a contributor to wound care education in Canada, and it's always a treat to hear his talks. And again, for, for uh, Professor Harding, he's tuning in late at night, so we definitely uh, appreciate him coming on to share his expertise and wisdom today. So without further ado, I'm happy to pass it over to, uh, to Professor Harding. Thank you. Thanks very much, Troy. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Apologise me giving you indigestion over your supper, uh, but at least I've got a novelty accent that probably eases the pain a little bit. Uh, I've been asked to talk about lower leg assessment and the use of this uh, gecko device, which is a, a stimulator of the common peroneal, or as old people like me, known as the lateral popliteal nerve, uh, where it wraps around the head of the fibula at the side of the knee to stimulate calf muscle function and contraction. All that guff on this slide just says I'm old and I've been around forever and a day. Um, so declarations of interest. Um, I'm old, been at it for 40 years, done lots of bits and pieces. Um, hopefully, I still retain some degree of credibility as a clinician and as an academic. The objectives for this webinar to look at the key components of lower leg assessment and the interesting thing which hopefully you'll see in a few minutes this i would say is the medical model one of the big challenges that we have in seeing patients with wounds is the, the lack of medical input uh, and the lack of comprehensive medical assessment uh, the interesting thing about blood flow my view is vascular surgeon just glorified plumbers uh, and they get the red stuff to where it needs to be. The real action is the transport of the oxygen from the blood to the tissue to get those cells doing the things it's supposed to be doing. Uh, I've got some interesting uh, data that we've published and some we've just submitted ar around the impact of gecko on blood flow. Um, and I present some of the results uh, from the last paper uh, that we had published uh, at the end of last year. Uh, of a RCT of gecko in, in leg wounds. And then there's some ideas, and they're, they're personal ideas, so you can take them or leave them as the potential use of gecko going forward. Those of you who read the International Wound Journal may have seen uh, this produced mainly by my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Douglas Queen, the other editor, uh, as part of an editorial where we were actually looking at uh, the countries there's a whole list that goes on for three pages of how much uh, is spent on wounds per country in the world these are the top 10 countries you'll see that uh, both canada and the uk are up there uh, the per the ppp is is purchasing power parity and it's not real money in, in billions of dollars but it, it's actually ex the exchange rate to bring the same be able to equate different countries different economies um 
look at the US, there's an, a, probably a table they don't want to be the head of, but they are head and shoulders above uh, Canada and the UK. The important thing is that my belief for a number of years is when we're talking about wounds, no data equals no problem. When you're talking to planners, politicians and strategists, we now have data emerging, even though there are estimates in here and the purists might criticise us for publishing it. Uh, but they actually show uh, that this is the amount of money that's being spent. And I might argue, uh, and I'll say it because I'm talking to uh, people mainly from another country, uh, is that the inefficient use of those resources to provide care for patients uh, uh, with wounds uh, is something that we should be ashamed of and something we should be doing a lot more about uh, to actually provide uh, value for money for our uh, governments and countries. Here's the US. Uh, you can see 140 some billion dollars. We can even break it down per state. And you can see that there are differences there. Uh, not only in, in the US, we've got that deg degree of granularity. We've also got it in China uh, with uh, the uh, yuan. Uh, that, that's the currency that they have there. And then Australia, small country, smaller population. But all of these are in billions, the, the sum total for the countries uh some of the smaller states are in millions but large sums of money oh where did this little place come from oh canada yeah 11 billion hmm. you're in there and you have your own problems so i'm not necessarily being critical of anybody who's listening to this who's a strange man abusing us um but, re but really it, 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 this is to say that this is a global problem where anywhere you go in the world you'll find the challenge of patients with wounds increasing cost of wounds increasing but the quality of service not improving, and in the many parts of the world that I visit is actually deteriorating. So what we uh, do need to recognise is that there is a huge room for improvement and an urgent need for improvement. And I can give you a bit more detail from the UK, not from God's country where I am, which is Wales, but from England. Uh, this is the unit, the commissioning groups of the units of management of the National Health Service, and they're, they're, they're brought down to caring for just over 11,000 patients each. Interestingly and often forgotten, under traditional definitions, 40% of wounds that are seen in, in these uh, NHS units are acute wounds. There's an interesting debate and a talk on its own is how do you define an acute and a, a chronic wound? Nearly £3,000 per patient. And the interesting thing with the changing demographics uh, in our population uh, we need to increase our healing rates by 1% a year to put a lid on the total uh, cost of wounds to a healthcare system. And at the moment, guideline-based care, guideline care uh, results in the best outcome. But how, how consistent are we in getting guideline care to every patient, every wound in our countries? Let's move on a little bit to um, the... Uh, challenge of venous leg ulcers. There's the number of patients a, a year in England, cost three billion, forecast to grow to four percent of the population as we end up with uh, a, an increasing percentage of elderly people in our population. Female to male uh, is anywhere between 1.5 to 10 to 1. Huge impact because it's a chronic disease on care, labour market and health related quality of life. And this is interesting and certainly surprised me, and I'm not often surprised these days. In the UK, venous disease is one of the top 10 reasons for a patient seeking care in the, in the community, the general practitioner or family physician, uh, which is interesting when you see you know anything can walk through the door from sore throats, earaches to cancer. This first part of the talk, I want to focus on this book, which is about three or four years old. Uh, this is a textbook that uh, we produced the second edition of about three or four years ago. Um, and basically, you can look at it two ways. One, it's got my name on it, so you can say, well, that'll be a novelty. Um, or two, you can actually say, if it's in a textbook, it must be right, because if it isn't in a textbook, it, uh, it's too young to be out it. And this was a, a book that we published in, in response to people are coming to the clinics, come to talk to us and say, what I need is a practical textbook. So if we look at 
wound assessment because this is the, the first bit of the meaty bit before we talk about uh, the other things around gecko is to recognize we have to have an assessment an overview is most wounds here without difficulties but all wounds have the potential to become chronic so the three classical leg ulcers diabetic foot ulcers and pressure ulcers uh, are not necessarily uh, capturing all of the problems that you'll see in a healthcare system this is the bit that, that I've been focusing on in recent years. The key to successful wound management is diagnosis and treatment of the underlying cause, which requires a detailed history and assessment. The important things to look about in trying to get a specific diagnosis, also important to recognize that wound belongs to a leg, which belongs to a person. And that person can have lots of other things wrong with them, which may have a direct or indirect effect on their ability to heal wounds. It is also important, but we're nowhere near it at the moment, is to recognize because in many of these situations, we don't under, we don't cure the underlying pathology. Many uh, Some of these patients will end up with their wound non-healable. And there is, despite the fact we can't heal them, it's not a fault of us or a fault of the patient. It's just a statement of fact. Uh, but one of the things that's important is that the uh, patient uh, and the clinician should be honest with each other and, and to say that we, we cannot do it, but we can make it more comfortable for you. Recognize that carrying out this wound assessment, many complications can occur in chronic wounds. Uh, from obvious ones in terms of sinus formation, malignant transformation, systemic amyloidosis, heterotopic calcification, and so on. Whatever, you, you can make that list as long as you like, because you always find something that's happened to a patient with a wound that you haven't expected. This is just four examples of patients with chronic wounds, and what we're saying is you have to carry out that wound assessment. Absolutely no problem. The bit that doesn't happen, however, because uh, consistently, is patient assessment. And that's what I'm trying to get people to recognize. We need to do as, as, as good a, a wound assessment as we can, but equally, we need to do a, a, a comprehensive patient assessment. Looking at the diseases that will cause ulceration, they're listed here. Now, there's the obvious venous, arterial, lymphatic, etc., but all the way through to neuropathic, metabolic, connective tissue disease, uh, the vasculitis, vasculitides, uh, hematological disease, and lots of other things. And this isn't trying to you know, confuse you by throwing at lots of big words at you at a great rate. It's just saying that if you've got that diversity of pathologies, we haven't and we are unlikely ever to get a unified treatment to treat all of those wounds. And it goes on to another page, other causes of uh, ulceration. Important to recognize this, important to strengthen your assessment. Appreciate that there are many factors that can and do impede wound healing. These in this table from the, that textbook are divided into local and systemic factors. Uh, if you read down those uh, columns, you, you could look at that and said. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. But how many times have I actually thought of the one or more of those being present in a patient when I have trouble in healing it? Because if we haven't thought about it, we're going to miss opportunities. Um, one of the concerns that I have for all clinicians seeing patients is the so-called unconscious incompetence. You don't know what you don't know. But when you know these things can occur, it makes you think much more critically as to what is happening in that patient and is there something I can modulate or to uh, alter in one way or another to shift it from non-healing or slow healing to more rapid healing. This is a, a squamous car carcinoma on the knee. The interesting thing was not so much the um, appearance of the wound. The interesting thing to me was you don't normally see wounds like that on the side of the, the kneecap of the patella. And it was the unusual sight that raised the uh, antenna over this before I'd actually looked at the detail of the wound. Uh, but the, we used to see, because uh, I've now retired from clinical practice, um, these occurring with regularity in the clinic, being seen, being treated by somebody somewhere um, and for a year, two, three years, and it wasn't getting better. In fact, it was getting bigger. What, what was going on? And... This one you can probably see 
the raised granulation tissue, it's relatively easy to say this is an unusual bed and the edges there. This is the scary slide. I mean, you're not meant to read it uh, because it's difficult to get an, or get over an all, awful lot of things in this slide, but it serves the purpose, as far as I'm concerned, to say this is comprehensive patient and wound assessment because we have the patient here, we have the wound there in terms of assessment. The important thing is we come down here, we have the wound here. Is it healing? Is it stabilizing? Are we affecting wound bed preparation? And we have the patient over here and looking at the reasons why uh, that may be uh, having difficulty in, 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 in uh, get, um, uh, improving. Let's make it a bit easier for you and strip out the stuff around the outside. This is the, the basic process. I've talked about assessment, but you have to have an assessment and you have to use diagnostic tools to make a diagnosis. This is my therapeutic armamentarium as a wound healer or a woundologist. Uh, and yes, we have dressings and bandages. We're going to be talking about a device in a minute. But how many of us have actually thought about drugs either used to treat wounds to make them heal or remove drugs that the patient may already be on for other conditions, which may be having an effect on delaying healing? Surgery absolutely has a role to play. But unfortunately, we have to convince some of our surgical colleagues, not every wound is cured by an operation, and particularly when the patient has been through 5, 10, 15 operations and it's still not getting better. It's probably uh, not uh, being affected positively by surgery. And particularly in the US, there seems to be a, a real interest and focus on biologically based therapies, where there's stem cells, umbilical cord, placenta, uh, engineered, uh, tissue engineered uh, proteins or growth factors. All of those along there have a role to play. But many of us get focused down here and don't see what's going on here. But I'll show you some interesting things about devices, because even in my years of practice, uh, I, I've, you know, the arrival of negative pressure therapy has changed the, the way we do it. And that's a device. It can be a very effective device. I'll talk about another one in a minute. We're you're carrying out the assessment of the patient and the wound. Here's just two examples of, of, an, uh, of ulcers, a venous and an arterial ulcer. Uh, so you can see that they're different. Here is the, the overview of the chapter, multiple causes. But venous disease is most common, said to be about 70% of leg ulcers. Dual or multiple uh, etiologies can, can coexist, especially in elderly people. All patients with lower leg ulcers should be evaluated for peripheral arterial disease and routine use of the ABPI, ankle brachial pressure index, should be undertaken, which doesn't confirm you've got uh, venous disease. It confirms or excludes that that leg has arterial disease in it. Important thing at this moment in time, uh, there is no routine screening test to look for venous disease in a leg. Because uh, what you tend to do is say, uh, is this a, does this leg have features of venous disease and does it have a hole in the leg? And if it does that, it's probably a venous ulcer. This is the important bit of this, because <clears throat> compression is a mainstay of treatment of all venous leg ulcers. Uh, and increasingly evidence is emerging for... Uh, superficial venous disease, uh, surgical correction, uh, radiofrequency ablation of incompetent uh, veins is, is what's being used. The other thing is that an arterial patient with an arterial also when you've assessed it needs to be seen and assessed by a vascular surgeon. Uh, because it is important that they are not denied access to endovascular or formal reconstructive surgery uh, to uh, deal with the underlying peripheral uh, vascular disease. Again, on this slide, uh, I've separated out venous from arterial uh, with fact features in the history, the site, the edges, the wound bed, exudate level, et cetera, et cetera. And the important thing is, although these are two diseases that will produce holes in the leg, they are caused by different pathologies, so the treatment plan goes down different directions. But it is important, the more you look at this thing, is that have you looked at other diseases, rarer causes, 
of chronic leg ulcers because sometimes it's missed when everybody believes it's either venous or arterial. And if it's not one of those, if they're not getting better, there's nothing you can do about it. I've already mentioned compression is the cornerstone of treatment for um, uh, venous disease. Uh, the, the three in red here, venous insufficiency, lymphedema and lipoedema, are probably the, the classical places where people would see the use of compression. What I've done here is to look at other reasons why you get edema and other problems. And one of the things that I felt that you could probably say with a great deal of confidence, any swollen leg that, has, that does not have non-treated ischemia or active inflammatory disease is something where compression should be considered. I'm not advocating that everybody with a wound in their leg has uh, effective compression bandage or stocking systems on it. I'm just saying that you do need to consider that edema is caused by lots of reasons. You have to understand the reasons why that particular patient has, de has developed the edema to come up with the right treatment. This is to emphasize it a bit more. If you actually look at the cause uh, of edema, we've got cardiac disease, liver disease, renal disease, gastrointestinal disease. All of those things are something that should be considered in proper comprehensive assessment of patients, again, often forgotten. But we come back to the uh, challenging cases. Even I can't heal those. I'm, I'm good, but I'm not that good. Uh, and the days of miracles have, have gone for me, I'm afraid. But I can do something to manage pain, swelling, smell, leakage for that patient. One of the things I was also asked to talk about was vascular assessment. The classic one is looking at arterial disease. And then the, the so-called triphasic signal, the biphasic signal, and the monophasic uh, uh, signal are ways that you can look at uh, categorizing severity of peripheral arterial disease in these patients. And this is a slide that's come from uh, the International Working Group on the Diabetic Guidelines, uh, last published last year, which is they're suggesting that is something to consider. But there are problems with the diabetic uh, vascular assessments because of calcification of the arteries, and it, the people are doing much more toe pressures these days. Now, this is deliberately sim uh, simplistic, not to um, embarrass you or to treat you without re respect. But one of the things I was looking to do is to get people to think about uh, the circulation uh, and basically the big square or rectangle in the middle is, is the body. The heart is at the top and that's the pump. All right. You can see that uh, I'm very simple and straightforward because that's where the arteries come in. The other thing that's also important is they then go into the microcirculation, the small vessels in and around the skin and certainly in the wound area. Uh, and then you have the veins transporting the blood back to the, the heart. If you've got venous in occlusion or incompetence, if you've got peripheral vascular disease uh, or occlusion, uh, then you affect the flow of, of blood around that system. What many people have not really thought about until recently is the potential role of the circulation, the capillary beds, that the very small vessels that you certainly couldn't operate on, uh, but allow you to increase volume and oxygenation to the tissues to get a wound to heal. And that's where the challenges come in. And the wound assessments will go on. Uh, this is an angiogram, and you can see this is a patient with an occlusion here. Um, and this is what it looked like clinically. Uh, this is the assessments that you would tend to use. Ankle brachial pressure index between 0.8 and 1.0 is seen as evidence that uh, there's no arterial disease and therefore safe to compress. So therefore, it, it, this may be a venous ulcer if there's nothing else found. Toe uh, blood pressure, which is systolic pressure in the um, in the toe, which is good in diabetics because, as I said, these calcification of small vessels, and then the microcirculation TCPO2 is, is a, a, a research tool, but is not a routine clinic uh, use. Uh, a big problems of going back to remeasuring the same spot and the precise location. What I want to spend a little time in a minute talking about is laser speckle, which is a measure of microcirculatory flux or change. Uh, and it's something which I believe is the way in which we can demonstrate effects of newer things and different things in getting wounds to uh, move towards healing. Just to show you this, this is a laser speckled image. And if I just put this one on, the ulcer is there. 
This is the increase in the, the microcirculatory flux around the ulcer itself uh, as the heart beats. If I press it again, this is what happens when you actually put the gecko device on to actively stimulate calf muscle pump to drive venous uh, flow or venous blood back to the heart. Uh, and all right, you could argue the way in which it's quantified, but hopefully you'd agree that this image here, something very different is happening there when you have the gecko applied to here, when it's just resting with, with blood flow uh, changes. Decided. Oh, thank you. Why do I always break things? That's what I want to know. You might need to... Uh... Oh, another pause. You might be able to progress for another pause. Maybe not. There, there you go. go. Uh, so th th this is um, using the laser speckle uh, uh, device uh, to actually look at difference around velocity and pulsatility. These are terms which we don't tend to use in routine clinical use, but they do uh, they do get used in research studies to look at basically how you can change that microcirculatory flow uh, and, and you can measure it with these uh, devices. Uh, and you can see these are papers that have already been published. One of the other things we've done with Gecko, which is interesting, is the issue about measuring improvements. When I'm carrying out assessments, I come back and assess them again soon afterwards. And this is what we're doing here, where we're actually looking at measuring wound area by different methods. Here's our two artificial wounds here and here, A and B. Wound closure measuring total area healed. A is, is faster at, at healing than B. Scenario two is wound closure measured by percentage area healed. And here, with those two artificial wounds, B is healing twice twice as fast as that in A. Uh, scenario three is wound closure measurement by um, movement of the uh, margin advance. So you're looking at the uh, margin of a wound decreasing, and you get a linear relationship. And we would suggest that this may be a, a way in actually plotting decrease in size to look at the gradient at which that wound is getting better and can you demonstrate effects uh, of a particular patient. And here's uh, the wound margin advance, the one that gave us the straight line um, and, and in the uh, two graphs here, and you can see it's almost, almost but not quite uh, a straight line uh, over time, and here is the wound margin advance uh, uh, progressing over time in that patient. What this led us to do was uh, test this situation, which will cause problems, and people will get very upset, uh, I suspect, because we're challenging the dogma, is that this is the rate at which the patient with a, a wound heals normally. Can we put something else into uh, the, that patient's treatment thing and see if we can have a second period of time where we can see uh, that that wound heals at a different rate? Now, we've published something on this, but other people have also published around uh, wound margin advance and, and recognising that this is something that uh, has potential. This is a study design of, of one of the uh, RCTs we were doing, where we basically screened the patients, brought them in, uh, had a run-in phase for 0 to 28 days where they had standard of care, which was compression systems. Uh, and then they followed on uh, after the, uh, 28 days to randomize into standard of care on its own or standard of care with uh, the neuromuscular uh, nerve stimulator. And then they had four weeks of that treatment from days 28 to 56. And then we looked at healing healing rates and numbers completely healed. And then we had a smaller study following patients up for a few months afterwards. But the important thing is that this is not a crossover design. It's a within patient control. The first four weeks, we demonstrate the speed at which that particular patient's wound is healing. Uh, with standard of care, we then randomize them, uh, as you do in a randomized control trial, to uh, receiving, continuing with that, or to uh, have the gecko device applied to try and assist it, and looking at does the gradient change uh, at the end of week four before you start the second four weeks. 
Here's the demographics, which is, is really just to show it was a real study with real patients, and there's nothing much there uh, to get excited about. This is interesting. Uh, basically, a lot of people were concerned that when this device is put on, your leg twitches. Uh, you know you've got enough uh, power going to the nerve stimulator when your, your foot twitches. Patients will get fed up of it. But we're finding in a number of studies that over well over 90% of the patients are finding it acceptable and will adhere to the uh, treatment regime. Here's the uh, one of these uh, patients uh, receiving standard of care alone uh, with it changing over from week zero to week four. And here is with the standard of care with the neuromuscular electrical stimulator, uh, again, from week four to week eight. So the important thing is recognizing it's the same patient, and we have had two periods of four weeks within that uh, time we were seeing them to shift it forward. And here's the p-value associated uh, with put gecko in addition to standard of care for these patients. And this is what this graph is designed to show here on the right. Uh, the other thing that's also important is to appreciate that the healing rate in the gecko-treated uh, patients was 2.2 times faster than the, the standard of care alone. So we, we were making a difference by doubling the speed at which he was healing over four weeks. We've not taken com uh, numbers to complete healing. We've just looked at rates of change over a four-week period. This is the latest paper that we uh, published in December of last year. Uh, this is the Journal of the Wound Healing Society in the United States. Uh, this is the study design, uh, which is too small for you to look, so I've split it in half. Uh, uh, 171 patients were uh, recruited, screened, people are taken out. This is the run-in phase with, with the standard of care. Um, and then at, at 28 days, they're randomized after the running phase uh, to the second one. And the important thing there is, is looking at the uh, reasons why we might take them out uh, and the reasons why, why uh, we might have less patients at the bottom end than we had at the top. That is not a, a, an atypical of chronic wound studies. We had 29 in standard of care and the gecko device and 22 in the standard of care device. Uh, so it's a, a slightly modified intention to treat design. And the end of the trial was the end of the second four week period, day 56. Again, in this study, you can see lots of demographic information. Here is uh, looking at the uh, way in which we can um, uh, measure uh, the change in, in rate, percentage area reduction. So we, we would the wound margin advance is something we would recommend as being the based on our experience uh, the most meaningful and accurate. But we can still get the same effect when you're looking at percentage area change. So if you have a big thing about wound margin advance, then you can uh, use that. And similarly here, uh, the the running phase and the four week treatment phase. What we would suggest from this work is that there is a novel study design has been used previously. It allows individual patient healing rate to be calculated. The rate of response is almost linear over a four-week period. can be tracked using this wound, uh, um, measurement advance. Uh, and you can, increase, uh, you can increase the healing rate in the same uh, patient uh, using this uh, design and this calculation and demonstrates the impact of new therapy under test. Um, and we can double the healing rate. But this is important because uh, I know people are going to get upset about this. We have never said this should replace RCTs. But if you look at the, our standard RCTs for uh, uh, chronic wounds of watching healing over 13 weeks, you're going to cost you at least $5 million to, to do that. Uh, wouldn't you like to have a bit more reassurance that your data is robust rather from a 10, 15 patient pilot study where you commit to spending that amount of time, effort and money and patience uh, on a study where you may not uh, produce a positive outcome at the end of the 300 patient uh, two-arm RCT study? I'm not going to mention much about this because just to make sure we recognize the work that Canadian colleagues have done uh, on, on uh, doing evaluations of gecko in Canada. Uh, there was two studies uh, looking at 11 patients recruited from the clinic, uh, and then they had 
therapy for six hours a day, which is less than we now recommend, or is recommended by the company, I should say, uh, which is recommended 12 hours a day uh, for keeling ulcers. Uh, and here's uh, the, the service evaluation with the eight of the 11 patients healed. Um, and the important thing is that, uh, again, it suggests that there is something there uh, going on when these patients are exposed to gecko. Here we have a uh, second pick of 15 patients uh, who uh, was was seen in a wound clinic uh, in Canada, and this was compared with <coughs> historical controls and then looking at uh, the area perimeter, and the area over the perimeter, the shown changes in time. Uh, the important thing is to appreciate uh, that all of this is meaningful data to give you more confidence to invest more time effort in, in things going forward. So this neuromuscular electrostimulation device, gentle contraction of muscles in the calf, compress the vascular system, increasing the lower limb blood circulation, preventing conditions associated with venous stasis, accelerates edema reduction, increases microcirculatory and capillary flow, and blood flow increased equal to 60% of walking without the patient having to move, to move increased perfusion. Uh, and I came up with this is probably achieving the effect of compression without compression. The important thing has been suggested uh, by some people uh, where you might want to use gecko, fixed ankle joints, uh, which are wounds that aren't getting better, uh, when compression can't be tolerated, when edema is present, or when patients have pain associated with their wounds. Because it wasn't ex expected in the early days, but a number of us have commented on the number of patients who seem a dramatic reduction in their pain scores when they're treated with this. My hypothesis, and it's not a, a, a proven fact, is I think it's uh, a lot of the patients with pain is due to edema. If you get rid of the edema, the pain goes away. That's my suggestion. Here's where we go back to our original slide that I showed my simplistic circulation. The data has now been produced to show if you put gecko on a leg, you get an increase in venous flow, you get an increase in arterial flow, and you get a change in microcirculatory flux. So that simple pump I talked about is a closed loop system. And that's the bit that many people uh, don't tend to appreciate. I've shown you this already. Here's the measurement of the increase in flux in the wound bed and the peri-wound area. Here's uh, another study where we're actually looking at pulsatility uh, and um, uh, uh, flux increases. Here is a paper that's been uh, submitted, but not uh, accepted at the moment, which is looking at arterial a flux or the arterio arteriolar end of the capillaries. And basically from baseline to uh, the, the second time point, you see an increase in flux and peri wound flux in the vast majority of these 11 patients. Similarly here in pulsatility in the wound bed and peri wound area. And here is a, another a study where we're actually looking at patients with mixed disease uh, that's what the wound looks like. That's it at rest. Uh, and the right-hand one is is the uh, with the gecko working, again being submitted and suggesting you have an improvement in microcirculatory uh, features there. Wound bed flux in, in patients with arterial disease, uh, 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 the important peri-wound flux, uh, pulsatility, uh, two different points. All of these are showing improvements in that uh, the, the microcirculatory flow in these patients with different degrees of vascular disease, different locations. Here is uh, heels in patients with diabetes, and again you can see the same differences taking place there. Uh, and the, the, the these are papers that we anticipate being uh, there in the public domain in the next two to three months. And that's why that simple slide, even if you don't want to deal with all the complicated stuff with, with the big words, it, this is useful to you, in my opinion, uh, because it talks about the fact that if you can influence the microcirculation, which the gecko certainly appears to do, you'll have a benefit here, but you may have a benefit on the venous and the arterial uh, uh, side of things in that limb, in that patient. So in conclusion... Um, the important thing is that uh, gecko has a proven mechanism of action, which is stimulating the calf muscle pump to contract, which improves uh, microcirculation of venous return. 
real world use of the gecko shows a significant increase in rate of healing and the time to closure. We've shown in a, an RCT, uh, we get uh, larger ulcers, with, uh, we, we get ulcers to heal at twice the rate of standard care. The pain was reduced, uh, the adherence was there at 94%. Um, and the important thing is to recognize that this is something we're not saying it's either or, it's a standard of care and a comp uh, gecko device. You can't uh, alternate one with the other. But at the moment, as I say, the gecko is recommended to be used up to 12 hours a day. So neuromuscular uh, electrostimulation is a therapy for VLU. It has beneficial effects on circulation, both macro and micro circulation. Uh, and maybe we should be talking about concepts of multimodal therapy with compression and increasing venous return enhancing healing. There's some references for you, uh, which will hopefully help you if, if you want to learn more about this. Uh, and now it's time for you to ask me questions uh, because it's quarter to midnight in the UK uh, and I turn into a pumpkin at um, midnight. And by that time, you've had enough. Goodbye. Question. <laughs> Well, firstly, thank you so much. And I know we won't, won't take up tons of more of your time, but that was fantastic. And thank you for, for bringing us through it. We do have uh, uh, one initial question here that's popped up and uh, it's talking about the uh, benefits from vascular surgery with for patients with uh, lipodermosclerosis. Have you seen any yeah. benefit of that maybe versus the efficacy with gecko? What are your thoughts on that? Okay. Uh, there's a Lipodermatosclerosis is fibrotic skin seen as a consequence of venous disease, not arterial disease. If you've got straightforward arterial disease with an occlusion of one of the arteries in the limb, you have to have an assessment and an intervention by a vascular surgeon. That None of this is going to replace that. If you have painful lipodermatosclerosis, and many, many years ago, when I was a boy who short trousers, there was a, a vogue uh, from St. Thomas's Hospital in London uh, by va two very famous uh, vascular surgeons about a lipodermis, the area of a leg that got pain, more painful uh, uh, due to lipodermis was, was the sign that that was the next area to break down with a, the new venous ulcer. The, that hasn't been proven at the moment but those data slides are showing towards the end. We've shown that in venous disease, a lot in venous disease, we've shown a little bit in mixed arterial venous disease, a little bit in arterial disease, and a little bit in diabetics. So all of those seem to gain some benefits, but that that is not to replace vascular surgical interventions. It is to deal with ulcers where the microcirculation due to scarring or other things uh, may be impaired. So please don't, uh, say go off saying that you don't need vascular surgeons. I've not said that at all. The vascular surgeons are there for the vessels that they can do something about. This is looking at vessels smaller than the best vascular surgeon can uh, operate on or could see. Does that help? Yeah, that that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, switching over a little bit here, Jennifer's asking a little bit about uh, assessment tools for measuring wound margin and ad advancement. Are there any specific methods or tools that you use to measure that, especially when evaluating the effectiveness of gecko? Is it something you've looked at? Um, yes, but all of them have problems. You'll you'll trade off accuracy for cost. Uh, fancy ones that you might put into research studies will measure to the I don't know, fifth decimal point, a, a fantastic for a research study, but they're time consuming, expensive uh, and challenging to use. So you won't do that. What we were interested in was this uh, um, area reduction and the wound margin advance as ways that were much more likely to be a linear response. You can't use that trick that I suggested with that study design if you haven't got a, a, the wound reducing in size, if it's doing going to reduce in size uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a fairly linear manner. Uh, if it's trade, if it's drifting off that, then you, you 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 will struggle to get an association between the measurements you've made and what you actually see in practice. I would suggest percentage area reduction and wound margin advance should be the two things you should look at um, focusing on to give you some confidence that this wound is getting better or not.
Did that help? That's fantastic. Thank you for covering it. Um, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, one question is about how, uh, I know you mentioned about pain reduction a little bit earlier on. Um, any insights into how the Gecko device has impacted pain reduction and improved healing outcomes for patients specifically presenting with uh, atrophy blanche? Uh, well, atrophy blanche is microvascular ischemia, and that's why it's painful. Uh, so one might assume, based on the data I've shown you with the laser speckle, uh, that is, it is putting more blood or more oxygen uh, delivery to the tissues in those very small vessels. Um, that would be my approach. The other thing, as I mentioned, is that I think if you've got edema uh, on a, in a limb, you're more likely to be painful than if you don't have edema. And I've thought that that was one of the best ways of getting rid of pain in uh, leg ulcers was to get rid of the edema because the edema is not it shouldn't be there in the first place and you don't want it there. But many people don't focus on, on dealing with that. And I, I've been controversial uh, by saying that the ideal level of compression on a leg is when you've got the edema under control. It's not a specific sub-bandage pressure of 40 and 18, the so-called gradient um, from ankle to knee. Uh, it is, is that edema in that patient under control. Fantastic. And I just, uh, as a positive comment here, I'm just going to share what Sherry was mentioning in the chat here, talking about how uh, despite months of standard treatment for a patient with a DFU that approached the bone, they struggled to re re achieve granulation tissue. However, after using uh, the gecko device for just four weeks, they saw a significant improvement. Granulation occurred and wound eventually closed. Um, so uh, definitely a, a strong positive comment there from Sherry. Thank you. Um, one person is just asking, where exactly is the device applied? I know, we, especially in one of those photos, you were showing the animation there. Mm -hmm. um, but this person's uh, asking about that. Um, <laughs> shows my limited English abilities. Um, the lateral aspect of your knee joint, if you feel by there, you'll feel a little nodule of bone, a knuckle of bone. Just underneath that, is the common perineal nerve, which wraps around the that, that lumbar bone is the fibula head. That's where you apply the uh, electrode because that's where you stimulate the, the nerves close to the skin <clears throat> uh, and it's easier to, to get it to be effective. And you use the twitch in the foot uh, as a sign that you've got enough uh, power going to, to achieve the effect. Uh, if you're in any doubt, uh, ask, uh, experienced clinician or people from Perfuse, I'm sure they'd be happy to show you that. Uh, uh, but as I said, it's um, it's relatively easy when, you, when you've when shown where it is. And, and that landmark is one of those things in anatomy uh, that we learn that um, it's, it's one of those constant things that uh, you, you will tend to find. Fantastic. And I've got a question here that maybe I'll, I'll turn to, to Jeff or Paul or DeRace from Perfuse, maybe. Um, we just have someone who's talking about um, potentially implementing this in uh, community nursing for patients at the home. Has this been, uh, have you have you been working with people who've been able to do this uh, in the community? Um, I don't know if there's something you want to talk about uh, with regards to using Gecko uh, out in the community. I, I try. I, I guess the question is really going to become the community that they're in, because uh, in about half of Ontario, it's available. In BC, it's available. In uh, in some of the eastern provinces, available. So it's really uh, a difficult question to answer without knowing where the person's from. Yeah, and that's no problem. Maybe what we'll do as a recommendation, this uh, won't be the last time you'll hear from, from us and from Perfuse. What we'll probably do is if you have any specific questions about that, you want to talk about your area, uh, I'm sure uh, maybe a, a Kathy or uh, Jeff, you want to put your email in the chat there, but I'm sure we can get you connected after the fact. And I'm sure Perfuse will send an email out to our registrants. So you can definitely get in touch with one of the one of those reps there. Um I think that is looking like we've covered uh, the majority of these questions here. I'm just going to take a quick little little check again for all those specific questions for your area. For everyone who's asking about that, I would just recommend getting in touch with Perfuse. So what we'll do is I'll just echo what everyone else in the chat is saying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll let you head off to bed, but we appreciate uh, uh, both yourself, Professor Hart. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Jeff. Did you Troy, want to Tad, go ahead? Yeah. Tad's asking a question here uh, from Ottawa. Sure. Uh, yeah. And the the, uh, the cost is uh, $375 per week. 
and uh, it's very cost effective. We've had a, an economist actually from Ottawa that's been working on this, a PhD. And the, the same uh, research has been done. I, I believe, Keith, you've done some research on the cost effectiveness in the UK as well. So uh, maybe, maybe you could comment as well. No, it's very cost effective. Uh, we've uh, sent the manuscript off this week. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm just there as the token clinician, but there's two card carrying health economists who, who uh, run the, the model uh, and it, it, it is robust in its ability to show savings. Uh, Troy, I see about 18 comments in the uh, chat box. I don't know if there are any questions in there. No, we're seeing lots of thanks. Thank you. Great webinar, great presentation, fantastic information. So on that too, again, this will be, it is recorded. You'll be able to watch this after the fact. If one of your colleagues as well would be interested in this topic and uh, you're absolutely welcome to forward them to our website. Uh, we should have an email out to you in the next couple of days here with both your certificate and a link to the recording. For those who don't know, we actually are, will be having a repeat session of this of this webinar as well. Um, if you want to get more questions in, if there's something that pops up later, definitely uh, come and tune in with us. Our, our next webinar on the same topic with Professor Harding will be coming up. I can get the date for you right now as I uh, try to buy myself a second. We'll be on Wednesday, March 13th, and that will be at 4 p.m. Eastern. So slightly different, gives you a, a different time to come on and attend. If you know a colleague who wants to come on, definitely refer them to our website there. So without further ado, I'm going to say thank you to both Perfuse MedTech for this fantastic opportunity to have Professor Harding on here for this great presentation. And I will wish you good night, Professor Harding. Uh, good night to you when your night comes.